This is Brent of the Brookbush Institute and in this video we're going to go over a joint based manual therapy technique. If you're watching this video, I'm assuming you're watching it for educational purposes and that you're a licensed professional with joint based techniques within your scope. That means osteopaths, chiropractors, physical therapists, you're probably all in the clear. Physical therapy assistants, athletic trainers, massage therapists, you need to check with your governing body in your state or region to see whether this is within your scope of practice. Personal trainers, this is definitely not within your scope of practice. Of course, all professions could use this video for purely educational purposes to help with learning biomechanics, anatomy, and of course, palpation. In this video, we're gonna go over posterior to anterior sacroiliac joint mobilization. I'm gonna have my friend Melissa come out. She's gonna help me demonstrate. Now, Melissa's gonna lie prone, and you'll notice that I have the table fairly low because I wanna be able to get my chest over her sacrum with arms straight so that I can use my torso and not my hands or, or my arm strength to try to manhandle this technique. That's gonna wear me out very fast. Now, before we start this mobilization, we need to have good palpatory skills, and palpatory skills basically comes down to practice and anatomy, like you have to know your anatomy. If you haven't looked at the sacroiliac joint in a little while, it's good to review maybe an anatomy textbook, look at those illustrations, start identifying various landmarks and how they relate to one another, and if you can, get a hold of one of these plaster cast models. Uh, I know they're not perfect, and, and the, the standard plaster cast model is of a, a fairly small person, I would have to guess, maybe somebody who was like five foot four or five foot three, and Melissa here is like almost five foot eight, so it's not quite perfect, but it'll, uh, it'll do, and it'll definitely teach us quite a bit. Give you guys a couple landmarks that you probably should be aware of. Every time I'm looking to do the sacroiliac joint posterior to anterior mobilization, realizing that I'm going to be pressing on the sacral base, what I'm gonna to try to find is my PSIS. Right, I know that if I fall immediately, medially, and I had to practice that now, immediately, medially, medially off the PSIS, the posterior superior iliac spine, I end up roughly on the S2, S3 segment of my sacroiliac joint. Well, Okay, maybe you're not great at finding the PSIS. How would I do that? Well, maybe you start with the iliac crest, and the iliac crest is fairly easy to palpate, right? That's the, that's the top of your pelvis, the top of what people call their hips, where they wear their pants. So you could fall your iliac crest to your PSIS, and I personally like to find the under, that, that corner hook underneath the PSIS, so I hit the same point every time and I don't end up on this. All right, so I wanna be able to hook underneath the PSIS. Maybe I have to start at the iliac crest. Maybe you want to take it a step further. What does your iliac crest line up with as far as what spinous process of the lumbar spine? Well, it lines up with roughly L3, L4 spinous process. So I should be able to find those spinous process, work my way down, know that L5 is going to feel a little hidden, and then I'm going to have a divot, right, like a little fold there, and then I'm going to go onto the alligator back of the sacrum. And sure enough, if you tried to find that, I think you guys would find that it feels a lot like I'm describing to you, right? Like I can feel like this little divot in here, right? Which is like this part represented right here. Another thing you might want to be able to identify is, you know, where are the ischial tuberosity relative to the iliac crest? Where are the, where's the coccyx relative to the rest of the sacrum relative to the iliac crest? You kind of want to have a good visual model in your head of where all these landmarks are where your hands are and how to get back to what you're trying to palpate, which in this case is the sacral base. I would definitely recommend practicing on one of these plaster cast models by closing your eyes, choosing a landmark, laying your hands down, and forcing yourself to work through those landmarks until you end up on whatever you chose, right? Let's say I said sacroiliac joint here, right? And then when I open my eyes, am I on the sacral base? And I'm sure enough I am. You might want to even test yourself by choosing some of those other points like, can I find my coccyx, right? And sure enough, I found the tip of my coccyx. The reason being is people are not all shaped the same. You're gonna be working through various techniques, so you wanna be able to go from one technique to the other as smoothly as possible. And when you lay your hands down, you have no way of knowing, boom, there's my PSIS. You might get lucky. <coughs> And the better you get, the closer you'll get over time. But it is always helpful to, to kind of have a step-by-step -step process here. Let's, 
Let's use the simplest of these processes. I'm going to find the iliac crest. I'm going to follow my iliac crest to my bony notches being my PSIS. I'm going to hook my thumbs underneath the PSIS so I find those corners. That corner will lead me right to the S2, S3 segment of the sacral base, which is exactly where my thumbs need to be to do this mobilization. All right, so there you guys have it. We have all of our palpation leading to the landmark we need. Now, notice I kept saying S2, S3 segment of the sacral base. It's kind of odd, and I can't totally explain why from a biomechanics standpoint. Despite the fact that the sacrum is fused segments of the spine, right? They don't move separate from each other. It is helpful to mobilize the segments like they aren't fused, if you're with me. Maybe it just has to do with the breadth of the joint, like our thumbs aren't wide enough to mobilize the whole thing at once. Maybe it has to do with the way the, the bumps are, right? Like those joints don't, aren't two smooth surfaces together. They're kind of bumpy, right? They fit together like, with bumps and grooves. Maybe, so maybe we're mobilizing different bumps and different grooves as we move through the segment. But kind of keep in mind that if you find the S2, S3 segment, you're probably going to have to move up at least one segment, and you're probably going to have to move down at least one segment, maybe two. Right? So you could start your mobilizations however you want. You can start on the S2 segment, work up one, and then go back down twos to your S3, S4 segment, and maybe go down one more. Or you could find S2, S3 segment and try to start at the top of the sacral base and work your way down. Whatever you want to do, just understand that you're probably going to have to mobilize a few segments before you feel like you got good mobility back into what was an assessed stiff SI joint if you're doing this mobilization. Now let's talk about hand position. This is one of those techniques that works best with your thumbs, which is really unfortunate because this is a very stiff joint, which means it's going to take a lot of strength, it's going to take a lot of force to get a little bit of motion. And that's all you're really looking for is a little bit of motion. So again, if I find her PSIS, I fall off. My go-to technique is going to be just like this, thumb touching thumb. I'm going to try to find my first resistance barrier, which is right there. And then my end, which is right there. These are very close. All right, the, the first resistance barrier and the end, there's not a whole lot of motion. So trying to determine the difference between a grade three and a grade four mobilization, for example, is going to be very hard, if not impossible. Generally speaking, I try to find the end range, I back off, and then I mobilize. I think if I'm doing grade three, it's a little less intense and more mobility. Grade four, I'm really kind of digging in and doing small oscillations at end range, and I just kind of leave it at that. Trying to find the 50% mark or 75% mark for a joint that has very little motion to begin with is going to be very challenging. Now, just to kind of go back over the same techniques we've been doing through all these mobilizations, first resistance barrier, end resistance barrier, back off, do my one to two oscillations a second, kind of going from that first resistance barrier into roughly 50% until I get an increase in mobility. And then as I mentioned, I'm going to have to move segments. So I actually started on the S2, S3 segment here. I might want to move up one and then move down a couple. All right. Try to get all that mobility back that I possibly can. But this is just one hand position. Now I'm going to show you guys another hand position that I've been working on that I have a hard time with and I think you might have a hard time with it too, but I'm challenging both of us to try this technique. And that's to use pisiform handmate on the sacral base. The reason I think this is a challenge is because the PSIS actually hangs over the sacral base a little bit, and it's actually kind of challenging to get your hand, a thicker part of your hand, onto the sacral base. Now, maybe it's just me, and I've kind of mentioned before, I do have bigger than normal hands, right? And Melissa's, Melissa's kind of a, an average sized individual with average dimensions. Maybe, maybe my hands are just too big to, to get in there and you guys will have an easier time. Maybe it's a feel thing, like I don't, I don't feel things as well here as I do the tips of my fingers. 
either way, it's worth trying because of how hard this joint is to mobilize, how delicate our thumbs are, and of course if we're trying to extend our careers, I've mentioned several times that if you can find a way not to use your thumbs, don't use your thumbs. There's too many techniques already that are totally dependent on us being able to use our thumbs. The other big tip for this technique, or I guess the big tip for this technique is don't try to go on the same side. This probably won't work. If you go to the other side, it'll work better. Now this happens to be Melissa's stiff side and guys just as a, a pointer more often than not. In fact, almost always you only have one stiff SI joint. They usually both don't get stiff, right? This happens to be her stiff side. If I, if I was going to keep working on her with this piece of forehand ink grip, I'd walk around the table for you. I'm just going to show you guys kind of on her opposite side. I want to try to get underneath her PSIS and push down on her sacral base. So I'm going to find the PSIS, use my fingers to find where I want to be, put my pisiform hamate over my fingers, and then go this way. And you can already see this would be a lot less pressure on me physically. I think this feels okay. I'm not sure I've gotten the same outcomes from it as I do with my thumbs, but I'm going to keep practicing. I want you guys to keep practicing because I think this could be a career saver long term. How's that feel, Melissa? This probably feels a lot better than me pushing on your other side, huh? Yeah, so her stiff side is this side, which is why it's a little, a little bit more tender for her. So just a quick repeat of what I showed you. <clears throat> this posterior to anterior mobilization for the sacroiliac joint is definitely my go-to for sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Look for the stiff side, do my PAs, see if I can increase mobility. It tends to have a pretty big effect on my outcomes. I did this mobilization by finding iliac crest, using my iliac crest to find my PSIS, hooking my fingers underneath my PSIS, dropping off immediately, medially, right, onto my sacral base. That's S2, S3. Great. I can do this thumb technique or I can challenge myself, walk around the table and use my pisiform hammock because I know that'll be better for my career long term. And then of course I have to remember that I probably should move up and down segments and treat the SI joint like it has several segments similar to how I would like the lumbar spine as a whole. All right, guys, I have the plaster cast model set up here so you can see kind of where we're trying to get our hands when we do these two different techniques, the, the thumb over thumb technique for the same side, or we're trying to do that pisiform handmade on the opposite side. So here's the PSIS on the plaster cast model. We would fall right off immediately, medially onto the sacral base and do our PAs going segment by segment, or we would try to get our pisiform handmade down into this space here on the opposite side. That would be the other way to do this technique. Now I've had Melissa roll down her, her uh, belt line here just a little bit so that, that we're palpating directly on skin. Right? So you guys can see here if I follow the ilium down, I find her PSIS right about here. Right? So right just above her backside there, and then if I fall off immediately, medially, I'm now on sacral base. All right, so now I can get my hands in position, and I can find first resistance barrier, last resistance barrier, which is quite a bit of force, and then I can back off a little bit and do my one to two oscillations per second. Now, don't forget, you're not just going to do one segment, quote unquote, of the sacral base here, you're going to have to move up a little bit, make sure that you don't have stiffness higher, you're going to have to move down a little bit, and almost treat the sacroiliac joint like it's multi-segmented like the lumbar spine. Now what I've challenged all of us to do is to not just use our thumbs, which is kind of the easy way out, although very hard on our thumbs, and try to teach ourselves to feel with this part of our hand, go to the opposite sacral base by falling off immediately, immediately once again onto that sacral base and then trying to use that point of our pisiform portion of our hand to try to get some 
some good mobilization of the sacrum here on the ilium. All right, so you got your thumb over thumb technique, which of course you need to learn. Of course, it's a lot easier to palpate, but once you get that down, don't forget to keep working on this one just to save your thumbs and add a little longevity to your career. So there you have it. Assess, address, reassess. Make sure that every time you choose a joint-based manual therapy technique, it is based on an assessment and that you return to that assessment after you finish the intervention to see if it was effective for the individual, the patient or client that you have in front of you. Ensure that you continue to learn your anatomy because your anatomy is going to help you with your hand placement, with understanding what a joint can do, with understanding what you may gain from this particular technique. And of course, practice. You have to practice these techniques, hopefully not for the first time on a patient or client who just walked in the door. If you can find a more senior instructor or a mentor to give you some really good hands-on instruction, Use your peers for some good feedback. And of course, always look for live education to help with your manual therapy techniques. I know these videos make education very convenient, but there is no substitute for learning manual therapy in a live setting. I look forward to talking to you guys again soon.